Welcome to Creativity in Focus, a video podcast where we talk about art and self-reliance. And this week, we have a lot of things to cover. We are going to be talking about uh, wildlife photography, other types of photography, rock hounding, silver smithing, and we are going to make a jury box together. I can't wait. Let's watch. I'm here with artist Scott Aston, and we are going to be talking about a lot of things, photography, rock hounding, lapidary, silver smithing. Wow, you're really prolific. Yeah, <laughs> there's, there's a lot of things that I enjoy doing, and I enjoy uh, jumping in and trying a little bit of everything, and these are the ones that have kind of stuck with me. When, when was the first time you, you had this deeper feeling that creativity was a must for you and you needed to give a voice to it? You know, I think the at least with the photography, it started a lot back in high school. Um, I got to my senior year, they said, you need another art class to graduate. And I went, ah. Mm. I said, well, I don't, I've done ceramics, I don't want to do this, don't want to do this. They said, you would take photo, take photography. And I thought, great, I can handle that. And so I signed up and went through my first semester of that, did really well and didn't need any more art credits to graduate. And so my second half of my senior year signed up for advanced photo mm -hmm. and that just kind of stuck with me and ever since then I've kind of had just this longing to kind of create things and display those on how I see them uh -huh. and photography has been a great outlet and the silversmithing has been something I've picked up in the last uh, five six years and it's really just enabled me to say I get to do things my way I'm gonna put this together and create my own unique vision for this and it's been a blast that's cool that's cool and, that, and that's the best moment where we are as human beings right when we can give our own voice to things now when you're in high school what kind of photography were you doing uh, i was learning and so it was a lot of very very simple things uh -huh. uh, i spent a lot of time just getting the hang of things you know we'd get our assignments and they were simply you know want you to focus on a portrait or on a particular pattern and you know, so I'm kind of going around the yard or, or around the house to try to capture these things to fill the assignment but then outside of that on the weekends I could load up a roll of film and just kind of explore mm -hmm. and really say okay what do I want to do that that really makes me happy when I'm doing this uh -huh. You know, Very we had cool. lots of pictures of the pets at the time or things like that, but it was a lot of stuff outdoors. Uh -huh. I love to go outdoors and take pictures of landscapes, of nature, of wildlife. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, living in Utah like this, this is great. This we is our have everything backyard. Of, yes, that's awesome. Now, you mentioned it, not me, but you mentioned a roll of film. So did you used to develop them as well? I, I did. Oh, I, awesome. I, you know, in high school, they taught us the basics. So uh -huh. my dad actually says, here's a camera you can use. And it's this old New world. manual yeah. focus, <laughs> manual, everything needed to be set that way, range finder that's probably... 30, at least 30 years old at this point, mm -hmm. when I'm, you know, 16, 17 years old. So the course was, you know, they teach you how to roll your own film, you shoot the images, and that you had to develop your film, uh, and to develop the negatives, then you take the negatives, you'd make your own prints in the dark room. And so I had to learn it all from the very basics. Mm -hmm. And so that, that hands-on really helped me understand more of the the technical side of yes. photography rather than just the artistic and the artistic was all the, mm -hmm. the vision I created. And, and the cool part about that, I, I was talking to that with my daughter the other day because photography is also our passion, that now you see something you like and you go and then you look if it's good or not. Mm -hmm. And before I, 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 I had an assignment with a magazine, you had 36 shots and the cover of the magazine had to be th there, but you would only see that in a week or so afterwards, right? Right. So it put a lot of pressure, but at the same right. time, y you were always very critical of everything you were taking. Now we can play a little, a lot more, right? Because if we don't get it right in a second, we know that, and we can get. We can we can try again. Yeah. And that's that's been the some, you know, some of the benefits of digital photography is the fact that we're no longer limited to twenty four or thirty six shots. Yeah and we buy several rolls of film and shoot those and hope 
that we captured yeah. what we needed, we can just sit down there and well, yeah, I shot 500 images today <laughs> and now I'm gonna go home and scan through them and pick out yeah. the ones I need. Yeah. And delete the rest and forget about it. I wanna show them some of your wildlife photography first. Sure. So we have here a beautiful bald eagle. Tell yeah. me a little bit about that day. Okay, so we had, we'd actually gone out to um, hunt bald eagles down more of the central Utah part uh, during one of the events and it was on the way back We'd seen some, they were kind of far off. It, it, it just wasn't quite the opportunity that we were hoping for. And one of the people that was with us said, hey, let's stop down at American Folk Board, uh, the American Fork Boat Harbor uh -huh. uh, in Utah County. It's on the way home. She says, I went down there a week ago and there you, you park in the boat harbor, you walk down to the lake and then walk along the shore about 10 minutes and there's this bank of trees and she said, the trees were just full. <laughs> I went, well, if I can get two or three that's closer, I'll be in great shape. We get out there, trees are full. There's five or six of them up there. You know, the full adults with the big white heads mm -hmm. and then some of the juveniles with the mottled feathers that, you know, they don't, they're eagles, but they haven't quite grown yeah. into that, that iconic white head yet. And so we just sat out there and, you know, we'd get right where we needed to the position so that we could see them all in the trees. And then we'd just wait. And I'd snap some images and look around and just wait for them to take off and then just try to capture everything you can as it uh -huh. you know gets going and that's the exciting part to me is seeing them you know from from rest actually take off and then take flight with their wings spread Beautiful. and try to capture everything yeah. you can it's that, that unique feeling right yeah it yeah really is. and now one of my favorite subjects I, I think the the outline of this bird is so gorgeous the great blue heron it and is. they tend to pose for you, right, many times? They, they really do. Yeah. And, you know, that one I think we captured down at the uh, Farmington Wildlife Refuge. Uh -huh. And they've just come in now. They've, they've closed off the main road, but for a period of time, and I think you can still see them out at the visitor center, they've come in and they've got some man-made roosts. Mm -hmm. And so they all pile into this roost all day long now, uh, getting ready to, to mate. And... 15 of them sitting uh -huh. on these roofs. So it's really easy to just sit. And they do, they make some amazing poses where they're just yeah, stretched just out. They're very spindly, but very graceful uh -huh. birds. Uh -huh. And uh, so it, it makes for a good opportunity, especially learning that to sit down there, get the camera stationed and just say, okay, I'm gonna wait till one of you take off. And they're also not uh, quite as fast as some uh -huh. of the smaller exactly. birds. Yeah. So they're easy to track. And massive wingspans, gorgeous, a yeah. uh, lot of fun. Good point, because if a person is thinking about it, going to wildlife photography, mm -hmm. that's a really great subject, right? They are it slower, is. They because it's not that easy with birds, right? They tend to fly. <laughs> Com compared to some, some small hawks or yeah. falcons yeah. that are just really sporadic when they fly, and it's hard to keep track of them. Yeah. Because you'll have your camera up here, and you're like, you didn't go in... Uh, where are you? Yeah. Split second, whereas with a larger bird like an eagle or a heron, they do take, yeah. they don't move quite as fast, so it's easier to follow those, especially if they... And the owls, like this great uh, horn owl that you have, mm -hmm. same thing, right? Because they tend to be more like, what are you doing here? <laughs> yeah. Right? He was, he was uh, captured when we were out at, at Antelope Island, mm -hmm. and we'd gone down to the, the old ranch house down there. And we were kind of hunting around for hoping the barn owls were there. We didn't see any that day, but we were kind of looking around in the trees, just walking around. And somebody had mentioned that there was one out in the trees. And so we walked over and it took a minute to find him. Yeah. He was in there good. He was camouflaged <laughs> and he was just sleeping. Mm. And I'm sitting there thinking, this is great. He is so close. I don't have to worry about anything. Uh -huh. And I can just sit there, take pictures, take pictures, take pictures. And then he... He's kind of pokes his eye open and looks around <laughs> like, what are you doing? Yeah. I'm just going back to sleep. Yeah. And at one point he gave that big yawn. Nice. And that's what it, it almost looks like at first glance that he's sitting laughing at me. Uh -huh, uh -huh. But he's just got this big yawn, very expressionful uh, moment. Right. When he's kind of half awake and then yawns, kind of looks down at me. All right, <laughs> I'm going back to sleep. Very and he cool. just sat there the whole time. 
just let people take pictures of him if you were quiet and didn't disturb him. That's very cool. It was a. And then uh, this next one is one that we we have quite a few. The Northern Harrier, right? Yes. They, we have quite a few of them around here. They're very pretty birds. They are raptors, and they're definitely on the harder spectrum of things to capture. Uh -huh. They're on the harder end of things to get. Yeah. Smaller, and they Fly. they they will be flying, and they they're just erratic uh -huh. too when they start hunting. And this one in particular, I had been watching him for probably 20 minutes. And he'd take off and he'd start hunting, he'd stay low, he'd kind of swoop up, and then out of the middle of nowhere, he'd almost stop mid-flight and drop. Ooh, nice. Going after prey. Uh -huh. And uh, that's, it's hard to, to keep up with him when he's doing that. But uh, he eventually was hunting and then said, okay, I've got what I want, or had what I've, found over on this area to eat so now I'm going to take off and he veered across the road mm -hmm. and then into the fields and I went perfect I'm going to track you because you're you're leaving you're heading uh -huh. off and so it's easy to get you jumping out before you fly off onto that side and start hunting again very good now of course people that are looking at these pictures and thinking maybe I could do this uh, what kind of equipment are you using most of them uh, you know, I've got my, my digital SLR and, you know, a lot of new cameras, especially in the last five or ten years, you don't need the latest and greatest. You do need something that's going to keep up, mm -hmm. be able to, to shoot enough images per second to kind of stick with those, those birds to capture what you want. Uh, and then I use a big long telephoto lens um, that I just got not few handful of months ago that mm -hmm. I've been playing with now. Um, and it goes out to 450 millimeters, and then I've got a teleconverter to extend it even wow. longer mm -hmm. so that I can really get as close as I can. And that's, that's kind of been the biggest thing for me is by getting, as, you know, getting enough of a magnification to get as close as I can to those birds to fill the frame makes it easier to track them right. and to keep with them. And keep them safe as well, yeah. right? not disturbing them. Now, you, of course, you love wildlife, but you have another passion in the photography that you're exploring. Tell us about I, that. I have a lot of, I, I, the wildlife, the nature has kind of always been something that has just been with me. Uh -huh. That's always been it. But, you know, I've also really tried hard recently and we're, we're, we're getting there. It's, it's, it's a little harder to learn, which is, is astrophotography. It's taking pictures of the night sky, you know, um, dark parts of the sky. You know, when you're out in the mountains here, hiking or camping at night, you know, you can see the arm of the Milky Way coming up. Mm -hmm. You can see um, star clusters or nebulas or galaxies even on even shorter telephoto lenses. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't need a huge equipment. massive amounts of equipment. Uh, the problem is, is you do need a lot of light mm -hmm. coming in to expose this right. And so in a lot of cases, you can't pop the camera up and say, I'm just going to leave it for, you know, two minutes and, uh -huh. and walk off because as the earth rotates you get streaks all the star will go into yeah. the points of stars will streaks is what they become so you have to go into spots and shoot hundreds of images and then run them through software to stack them all together uh -huh. and that brings out all nice. of the details but if you slightly miss the focus as you're trying to focus on something that's millions of miles away down to a, a finite precision if you miss the focus then they're all out of focus and when they stack it doesn't work yeah. and so it's it's a lot of effort to to learn to figure that out yeah, um, okay we're still working on that awesome we've well, got some good results but yeah. it's it's with a lot of art you don't sit down and say yes i've done it yeah. first time and i'm done yeah. It's years and years it's, of learning. It's the, and, the thrill of the chase, actually. It yeah, really is. From, now, from sky to the earth, to the dirt, you're also a rock hounder. Uh, I am. So tell me about that. Uh, that, uh, you know what? I've had a passion for gems and rocks and crystals, gemstones, uh -huh. since, um, I can't remember. Forever. <laughs> I can't remember. My whole mom's side of the family you're either a rock hound or you're practically a pariah in the family. <laughs> oh, good. Everyone I like that family. does it. From my grandfather to my nieces yeah. to the youngest. And Utah, Utah is a great place for oh, that, it's, right? Oh, it's wonderful. So, so the ones that you have here, have yeah. you 
round any of them or no no. Uh, no these a lot of these contain um opal wow is from it ethiopia oh that's from ethiopia uh-huh ethiopia i uh, had a deposit come up uh that they found initially 15 17 years ago uh-huh and um have the, you ever tried rock hounding opal in Idaho at all? Yes. And is a total different type of this? Um, it's there is a little bit of a difference. Uh -huh. um, you don't get the the solid big chunks. You'll get them in thin bands, thin oh. layers. Those bit layers could be massive, um, but it's a thinner band. And okay. so you, when you work it, it's different too. But I used to go probably twice a year mm -hmm. for three or four years. And because of the, the situation right now, especially with COVID, yeah. they've had some difficulties getting the insurance they need to keep it affordable to the public because they've always wanted it to be a, a family yeah. event. And I loved it. I love being able to go up, you know, pay $20 and dig for an afternoon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's and so cool. The, um, they haven't been able to have it open for the last couple of years because of that. So in the case of these, uh, you work this in your machines as well? I do. It's, explain to us exactly what lapidary does. So with lapidary, um, you're taking a piece of rough stone. You are shaping that into a piece that you want. And with, with any of the stone works, there's a couple of different things you can do. There's the... The, a lot of the techniques with this is you cut it into what's called a cabochon. Mm -hmm. You'll have a flat bottom and a domed or an angled top on the stone. And so you have a particular machine with wheels or flat discs that you'll use to grind and shape that mm -hmm. material. You know, fastening is something that I want to learn to do. Um, expensive, yeah. even harder to find the instruction to do that. Um, but with these, these are all done on these lapidary machines. Beautiful. So you. So how big was this when you started? Because they do lose a lot, right? You, in the you process. do lose a lot. These three here in the middle, I actually did not use the traditional machines mm. as I do for the other uh, pieces. These are all free formed. When you've got a big, fast spinning disc, you're cutting, you know, clean mm -hmm. domes or clean angled lines. You can't do that with some of these pieces because there's, they're so they're left in the shape they originally were when I got them, okay. and I wanted to leave it that way. So you can actually get diamond bits that will flit into a Dremel or a flex shaft, and then I will sit with a bucket of water, a small dish of water, to keep everything cool, and we'll handwork mm -hmm. the entire piece from beginning to end through five or six stages of grits yeah. and then a polish to keep it in its natural form mm -hmm. as compared to cutting off a base, right. doming a top and putting it into a, an oval or a, Beautiful. a round shape. This, this piece, by the way, is gorgeous. Thank you. Now, of course, it was a natural transition for you to become a silversmither then. You had the yes. rocks, right? Yes. Um, I started... Uh, when I learned the lapidary several years ago at Pioneer Craft House, which is a place that used to be down here in Salt Lake that had affordable classes uh -huh. that taught a whole variety of art skills. Um, started there, and that was great. And eventually I got to the point of like, okay, I have this tray of stones. And some of these you keep in a collection. Right. It's a nice piece. And then I'm like, what am I going to do with all of these stones? And I've got more that I'm going to cut. <laughs> And it was. It was a natural transition into silversmithing. And so I started taking courses. And now? And now, you know, when the pandemic hit and they said, you know, we can't do this right now and everything's changing, I went, okay, here's the list of things I need to do to be able to do it from my kitchen table. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I, I did. And that's what you're doing now. And, and my spouse was the same way. They had actually started taking courses too nice. and we're like okay what do we need to get well we need this we need this we need let's this. make all a right. business out of it so i like we're, that we're going to start and we're going to order all the equipment and get a whole bunch of silver so that we can do it right now because mm -hmm. we didn't have you know the courses were nice we would sign up mm -hmm. and a lot of it got to be to the point where we would take the course for the community mm -hmm. We wanted to oh, be yeah. around other artists. Uh -huh. We wanted to help them. We wanted to learn from them and kind of share insights and, uh -huh. 
and it's it's really inspiring also for me just to be around other artists to see what they do and say that's really neat i like this element and i want to take this little element of this artist's work and incorporate it into that's my right. own mm -hmm. not steal the design i don't want to not but right. take parts of what they so you what inspires you there yeah and then translate that that's very cool now you do sell your pieces of course and of course the photography where can people go to see your work and get in touch with you sure so we've just i've just gotten to the point where i'm now starting to branch into let's do sales i have never been the one that i've wanted to make it a career mm -hmm. i tried that with photography i tried that going to through school say hey let's do this and the first thing i realized trying to do weddings <laughs> is that there were a few of them where i came back and thought that eh, wedding's not going to last and that's too much stress they're already fighting it was stressful <laughs> for me yeah and i did not want to take something i was so passionate and so much love for and make it the uh, this is what i have to do mm -hmm. to survive mm -hmm. if i don't book this gig i'm not going to have a roof over my head or food to eat so it's the i'm going to pull back nine to five and keep my hobby for myself mm -hmm. and then if i sell it great if i have a friend that says i have a gig we need you to do this i can then make the decision of do i want to to make some extra money or not so that's what i've done we're now getting to a point with this where i can finally say okay we're putting some of this out to sell uh -huh. because it's not a have to make, yeah. have to make, have yeah. to make. I'm more of the stay back and kind of create as it comes. Beautiful. And uh, so launched a website. Uh, What's the name of the website? Uh, blackowlartistry.com. Oh, it has the owl there. The owl is kind of that, that uh, favorite bird, I yeah. guess you could yeah, say. Yeah, I can see that. And it, it stuck. And so we've got, you know, pictures of these pieces up there we're getting to the point where i'm going to start getting those out on etsy mm -hmm. and linking that in there mm -hmm. so that we can do but there is contact information there nice um and then we've also been getting into some of the local art shows here very good in salt lake and well. and and classes as well i assume um we've i was teaching classes down at pioneer craft house uh -huh. um and that's unfortunately they've they've kind of shuttered up yeah due to covid they're looking for a new home. Not sure if that's going to come back. We'll see. Um, but there have been some other teaching opportunities that good. may be showing up good, shortly. Because it always it gives an, another stream of revenue. And mm -hmm. then you're sharing what you know. I mean, that's that's what we we need to trigger passions in people, right? Yeah. Be the photography, like we are, we are seeing some of your pictures. Uh, I just want to mention the metal ones. So tell me a little bit how... So you took the picture and then? Yeah, I took the picture. Um, you know, for me, you've always, I've always taken them, I've always printed them on paper, put them in a mat, put them in a frame, hung them up. And when we bought, we moved back to Utah. Mm -hmm. My spouse and I did several, seven, eight years ago. Uh -huh. Been in the home work for seven. And I said, you know what, we're gonna decorate, but I want modern looking feel to the art. Right. And so they, I started looking into this and I thought, well, I can put them all on acrylic. And then I thought, no, let's put them on metal. Uh -huh. I have one in acrylic, but the metal really makes them pop. Yeah, it's, it makes them very cool. Yes, it does. beautiful, beautiful. Well, Scott, I, it was a pleasure having you here. Yes, thank uh, you. So again, it's Scott Ashton and the website? Mm -hmm. Uh, blackowlartistry.com blackowlartistry.com get in touch with him yes and i hope to have you back here really soon oh, i'd love to be back thank awesome. you so much thank you it's so been much a pleasure <laughs> so i'm here with my friend fuse glass artist jody mccraney russia on her other side that is recycling creative recycling right yes indeed yes and you brought something for us today i did i uh -huh. did so one of my collections it's not a hoard it's a collection <laughs> yeah a is, big collection a big collection is uh is these great wooden silverware boxes and uh so i was trying to think of something to do with them because you know 
I, I get teased a bit about my collection. <laughs> and so what I did is I refinished this one, this beautiful walnut box, and I built on the inside this great jewelry box mm. insert with non-tarnished uh, fabric and some acid-free mat board. And I thought this, I'll bring this and we'll, we'll make one. Yes, yes. It's a, it's a pretty cool thing. Because many times we get the wooden boxes in things that come mm -hmm. to our house, like you said, mm -hmm. utensils. For sure. You also get them in recycling stores, right? In thrifty stores? Yes, yes, yes. So um, the ones that we're looking at today all came from thrift stores. Um, I am an avid thrift store shopper. Mm -hmm. uh, so what I wanted to do is I brought a couple of different types so you, we can talk about like what to look for, because nice. not all boxes are created equally, mm -hmm. of course. Um, so you want to do you want to look at some let's boxes? Let's do it. Yes. Let's look at some boxes. Okay, I'll set my my beautiful. So new this box was aside. a walnut one. You had this before. You, yes. You got in a thrift so shop. this is this one is from a thrift store, and one of the first things you want to look for is uh, you want boxes that are solid wood, right? And so this one very conveniently tells <laughs> us right on the bottom right there. that it's solid walnut. American walnut. That was an um, easy one, huh? Yes. So that was an easy one, and then uh, we have this one here which this is the one we're going to refinish and it's it's pretty rough you can see i paid a whole dollar for it <laughs> but this one also says oh, solid american walnut nice. right on it uh, and this is a knife box you can see it's kind of rough inside too uh -huh. so yeah, nice and then we have another one i picked up this one and this one looks really good at first mm -hmm. glance, but there are a couple things that you should notice here. Uh, one is if you look right at the edge of the box right here along that corner, mm -hmm. you actually can see that there's a texture and it's, um, you can see that it's press board. And then oh, if we, really? When you look mm -hmm, here? Yeah, oh. you can, because there's how no... How do I see that? Well, can you see how there's like no grain on no it? Grain it's just, it here. almost looks like chalkboard texture huh. a little bit. That's a very good tip. Yeah, and if you look on the back here, you look at all sides of it, uh, you can see this is where there was a price tag. It's peeled off and it's peeled some of the the mm, paper. The paper that is mm -hmm. covered. And here on the corner again, you can see the papers so peeling off. Not really worth to so, do much well, work with this, right? You, this, I will actually refinish this, but mm. when you have one like this, um, what works better is to paint it or lacquer it or collage it or okay. something like that. The decoupage. Mm -hmm. mm. Decoupage because it's it's not a solid wood box. So right. if we're, and you can see on the inside, it was a, it was, looks like it Painter's was an art thing. kit. Yeah. Uh-huh, one of those kids' art kits. But you can see that it's like a masonite mm -hmm. box. So it was it will still be gorgeous when it's done. Yeah. But it's just a completely different project. project. Could use yeah, Japanese yeah, paper yeah. on that. Oh, right. Stuff, right? Just some fabric yeah. even. Yeah. yeah, we could do some really cool things with it. So let's look at this walnut one, though, because this is the one that we want to talk about today. So the first thing we're going to do on this is take the hinges off so that we have two separate pieces of box here because we're going to work on both of them but do different things and you have no fear of taking the hinges off nope why would that be why would we not want to <laughs> <laughs> no uh, so what we're going to do is take the hinges off and then peel out the insides the guts and sand it and what i like to use on these hardwood boxes is um Wait, this one doesn't want to give up its hinges though, man. Uh, what I like to use on these hardwood boxes is something called Danish oil. So it's like a, a furniture oil that really nourishes the wood. It keeps it from getting dried out and it just, it does a really good job on that. It's a little more expensive than some finishes, but a little bit goes a really long way. And that's something to think, so, right? Because sometimes, like uh, this, might have stayed in a box or something—a box in a box—for well, for years, right? Yeah, for sure. It looks like it was in someone's basement or garage or mm -hmm. something. Um, so it's not a, a new box. Um, I'm going to guess it's actually probably from the '60s, just based Ooh. on the color and the materials that it's made out of, um, because it's got this red that was really popular. True. The '60s yes. and '70s, probably uh -huh. early '70s. Um, back in the days of shag rug and then we'll set those little screws aside because we'll need those um, and then it's got this weird foam Velvety stuff yeah. yes so usually these boxes have some sort of um, support thing in them 
to hold the knives. And so we're just gonna- Oh, that was easy. Right, we're just gonna pull those out, but we're going to be careful pulling them out because you can see that they have like little- Nails? Nails, yeah. So we really don't wanna stab ourselves with the, and see those right there. Hmm. That's not a super nice thing. And Ugh, then, that's yucky. I know, it okay, is a I'll little- I'll be around here. <laughs> Go rip that off. <laughs> it is a little yucky, but, and actually now, once we have that part out. Just don't breathe that. Just don't breathe that. Okay, we'll, we'll dump it over here by Shahar. Yeah, okay. okay. <laughs> thank you, thank you. I'm looking. <laughs> so what, we're do, what we'll do now is come back in here and I have these little pliers um, and we'll just, we'll pull those little pins right out. Oh, so they tend not to have a head on the no, other side. No, they don't. Sometimes they do. This one. You get a, just to clean your thing here. So I can walk around here. Oh, I have a rag here we oh, can Oh, you use. have a rag. Mm -hmm. Good, better than me. I couldn't find yep. mine. Look, Okay. here we go. I can do that. Okay. So, um, oh, but I want to wipe this out too. Okay. So once we have that out, you can see it's even now, it's a very useful little tray size. Oh, yeah. Right, it's kind of cute, just all by itself. All right, so we'll get this out. And there's a couple things to note here. One is that the top and the bottom are the exact same size. So once you know what size the one of the pieces is, you can mm -hmm. use the measurements to create inserts or liners um, for both parts. Oh goodness, look at that. Wow. This is a very typical thing for anything, any set that I'm on. Oh, really? <laughs> yes, it is. Yes, it is. <laughs> when Jody right? comes, when I'm yep. here, there's a mess. <laughs> okay. Perfect. Awesome. So the first thing, though, that I want to do is um, roll up my sleeves here. <laughs> So this is our lid, and I'm going to peel this price tag off. I How paid, much did you pay for that? I paid a dollar. One dollar. I paid one dollar. I paid one dollar for the other walnut one, too. Nice. And um, we'll peel that off. And I even brought a razor blade just wow. for this. There we go. Okay. And then what I'll be, I have a sandpaper here. This is a 220. If you have a finish that's in really good shape like this walnut box was, you can go ahead and just use a 500 and just give it a little buff. But this one is pretty rough. So we actually want to always sand with the grain on every piece of wood. How do I know? How do you know? The grain. Well, it's the long way oh. of the wood. Okay. And so we always want to sand. And the reason that you do that is if you sand against the grain, it makes the wood fibers stand up. Mm. and then your wood it won't be as smooth. Okay, and what we're doing, we're being careful here because sometimes these boxes, even though they say American walnut or something on them, they can be veneer, and veneer is a very, very thin layer of wood, and you can actually literally sand it right mm. off. And so we want to be a little careful not to, to do too much sanding not to take the veneer off. And I'm also not going to go all the way down. I just want to take care of this really bad part and then oil it and see where we get. All right, you can see it's got some nice water damage on it there. So when you're doing this, you'll notice though that um, you can't get it perfectly. May I have one of my rags back? This one, I think it's is cleaner. Less okay. yeah, damaging. Um, when you do this, you will never get it perfectly brand new again. And that's not our goal. Okay. Our goal is not to have it be perfectly brand new again. Our goal is to have it be beautiful, but show its age, just like me. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yes. That's right. And so I have my Danish oil here. And we just use a soft rag for this. I have, this is, uh, worn out pajama pants Ooh. that have then been recycled into rags. And the reason we're doing this first is because we put this oil on and then we let it sit. And so while we're letting it sit, we will um, build our, our insert, mm. our jewelry box insert. Okay, look. 
how beautiful that looks <laughs> yeah. already. Look at the difference, yes. Right? Wow. And so how much sanding did we really do yeah, there? Not, not, it was not bad at all. Oh. Very pretty. I love it. Yep. Love, love. I do. Walnut is my favorite wood. Okay. It's very wow. Beautiful. For sure. beautiful. Yeah. All right. So we're just, we'll set this aside. And what's going to happen here is the oil will soak into the wood and it will get a little bit darker. You can see it getting darker for now. For how long do you usually leave it? Um, so uh, the directions say leave it for uh, a couple hours, but it's so dry here that I'm just going to, I'll leave it. And if it looks like it's starting to get dry again, I'll add another coat. Awesome. Um, but you know, a bit. We'll leave it for a bit. Okay, so what we're using here to make our insert, and I'm gonna squeegee a little bit of this dust away. Um, we're using acid-free um, acid mat board. And we want to use acid-free items for the inside of our jewelry box because um, if you're using a fabric or a glue or a mat board that has acid in it, it will cause your jewelry to tarnish faster. Hmm. There is no perfect solution to keep silver from tarnishing. It will tarnish as long as it has some contact with oxygen, but we can slow it down. So what we're, what we're using is um, we have some anti-tarnish cloth, some fabric here, and you can get this um, from just about any kind of fabric supply place. We have acid-free mat board. Um, and a good place to look for this stuff is the scrapbooking section mm. because scrapbooking is also almost always acid-free acid -free. Yeah. because that that's needs good. to be archival, right? So that's one of the, the places to look for it. We have, again, an acid-free glue. And this is a water-based glue because solvent-based solvents usually have that some sort of off-gassing that will, mm. again, with the... And this is a cool one because um, one end of it has this mm -hmm. wide end and then one end is a little short or a little... Uh, uh, Very cool. Yes. Also used when scrapbooking a lot, right? This yes, kind of, yeah. exactly. It is a scrapbooking product mm -hmm. also. So we'll take our measuring tool and we need to measure how big the inside of our box is because we'll create a, a mat board insert and we will wrap it in the anti-tarnish fabric and it will just finish that whole inside base. So we have a piece that is 14 and three quarters by three and just a little bit less than a half. And we'll cut that from our, from our mat board here. So 14 and three quarters. and just a hair less than three and a half. So I just think this is a really great way to preserve a little piece of family history That's also, so right? Because you never know, Maybe this is the silverware box uh, that your grandma's silver came mm -hmm. in, and the silver could be still available, or maybe not. Maybe it's long gone. You never can tell. But that doesn't mean that the entire heirloom is gone, mm -hmm. right? I am actually looking for a box where I can do a treasure box from, you know, little things that we bring when we travel. Yeah. Well, you could use something like this. Yeah, exactly. You, it would be ooh, perfect. Ooh. That was a wild Did you little... drink? <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, you Shh. promised you weren't going to tell anybody about the martinis, <laughs> Shahar. <laughs> See how you are? Yeah, So I know. this will be wrapped in fabric, so it, it uh, you know, it doesn't have to be super, super perfect. We're about getting results, not about being perfect all of the time. Yes. Right? Okay, so let's take our fabric and move Ooh, my oily thing, just a hair. It's so, Velvety, it is, right? it's a little fuzzy. So if you don't have or don't want to buy um, this anti-tarnish fabric, what you can use instead is just organic flannel. Mm. Um, you know, because the organic flannel also 
doesn't have the, the chemicals in it that will cause your jewelry to tarnish. And then I'm doing this very scientific. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right? just my style. I heard that the here in Utah, actually, the tarnish is worse than in other places. Because really? Yeah, I, that's what I heard. I think because of the dry weather. I, the pieces tarnish faster. They, well, they do tarnish it, really fast, yeah. but I didn't. I did not realize that there would be a, a humidity. I mean, it makes sense that there would be a humidity thing. Yeah. Component. Okay. So one of the little tips here that I have for you, is when you wrap fabric around a stiff surface like this, one of the nice things to do is. Um, before you glue it on, to come in here and just trim the corners a little bit like this. And what that does is it reduces the volume of fabric that you have to wrap around the corner. Mm. So um, it just makes it a cleaner corner. So let's, let's do that. Very cool. We'll just cut those off and then we'll, we'll go ahead and wrap this thing. You, know, you can come to my house and fold laundry anytime, Shahar. No, thank you. <laughs> I don't do that in my house. But I, I need to feel useful when Instantly I'm here. Instantly and no thank <laughs> you. Did you see, do you hear how fast that happened? No, 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 no. <laughs> okay, so we'll glue on the back side. And this, that way we don't end up with um, glue spots on the, the side that you see inside the box. So I love this little glue with its weird little squeegee thingy. Mm -hmm. Satisfying. Well, right? It is. And then I like to do the short sides first. Maybe because mm -hmm. I'm short, I don't know. <laughs> and it sticks really well to the it fabric. It does stick well, really nice. well. That's and good we to just know. want to make sure we get it nice and not tight enough to bow the, the paper, of course. Mm -hmm. but. And then make sure we get a nice clean corner. I did not know about this fabric. No? Nope, never heard of it. No. Oh. That's interesting. It comes in a million colors, huh. too. Very so good. I think I'm going to order, I love this gray, but I think I would like some, mm -hmm. uh, like a sapphire blue. Surprise! <laughs> the blue lady. The blue lady. All right. Do you like that? Okay. Uh huh. Ta and the bottom. Right? It's done. Let's see and how it looks. the bottom is done. We probably should have checked the size. The size before. Before right? <laughs> we put it in there, right? But lucky for us, I have a new You had a pre-made yes, one. I do nice. have a pre-made one. Yeah, so, so double check, double right? Double check, double check, yep. There we go. Very cool. Pre I like it very good. Look, I, I already know 10 ways of oh. using this, even if it stays like that. Right, even if we do nothing else. Yeah, yeah. And Very actually cool. what we could do if we wanted is, um, so this one was a little bit too big. Mm -hmm. So what we'll do is just peel the glue before it dries. Because uh, we're all about not wasting things, mm -hmm. right? And just take our scissors and just cut a... Ooh, got a little wiggle there, getting my wiggle on. And then we'll wrap that back around. Yeah. And then it would. And then if perfect. we want to, we can actually put this inside the lid. Uh huh. So that the lid will have a liner also. Very good. Right, so there we go now. Perfect. Uh huh. Perfecto. Perfecto. And you can see our lid is actually getting quite, you can yeah. see the oil is soaking right in. Yeah. So then the next thing we do is we would create the sides for this. And this is quite a long skinny box. So um, I actually did the sides in two pieces. So there's one that goes this way and the one that does this other long side. Mm. And the reason I did that is because when you are trying to juggle, it's almost 15 inches per side for the long side, so that's 30 inches, plus another eight inches, it becomes this like, <laughs> this danger Will Robinson thing. So, what I've done here is I've cut long skinny strips of the mat board the same exact way uh, that fit right here 
inside the box. Okay. And they will stick up a little tiny bit, which is okay because then the lid will nest right down on top of mm. them. Okay. And the process itself was the same? The process is exactly the yeah. same. Um, and we can do a little one if you want. I have some. I think we're fine. A little, no, no, no. Now we're, now we're no. doing now it. Now we're doing it. Jody said we are doing it. We Jody are doing said it. we're doing it. We're yeah. doing it. But it is mostly yeah. just because it's really fun. <laughs> and you like to play and with I the like glue. And I like to play with the glue. Yeah. Right. So, um, but what we're going to do here is put it... Uh, what I want is that straight cut edge, okay, to be down here. Mm. And then what you do need to do is add a little bit more glue on top of the first layer of fabric to keep that second layer of fabric in place. It's almost like a bias tape with a yeah, true with a with a center. Mm -hmm. So you can see we have, we have these two, which have the seam on the center, and those are gonna be the side pieces. And the reason that they have the seam on the center is because they'll glue up against that wood, and You've so you don't seen. see the seams, yes. right? And then this one, which is longer, and this will be our um, zigzag piece on the, the inside there, it has the seam on the bottom, so that when it's in the box, the seam will be against mm. the bottom of the box and okay. you again won't Clever. see it, yep. right? This is my kind of sewing lady, <laughs> right here, right? No sewing involved. Yes. Okay, so let's just try this. Okay. And what we're going to do is fold it mm. right around that corner and then it is purposefully a little bit long because what we want to do is mark that. And cut then cut, it. So. We do, but what we want to do is just cut the paper, not the fabric, so that oh. we can wrap the fabric around the end okay. and tuck it in. Clever. It's because we don't want it to show, right? Ooh. So, ta-da, and then once we have both sides fitted, we can go ahead and glue that in. And then all we have left is to put the lid back on. Do you see how clever we are? No, we are. We are f I just mean, ast this is astonishingly <laughs> clever. <laughs> you know, it's, it's not only that you're avoiding throwing this out, right? Because mm -hmm. why? Right. And then you are uh, repurposing, giving a new life to that with your own twist. So, well, you, And you will create whatever box you need, be yes. it jewelry, be it tools or whatever and else. I like to think that we are actually creating uh, a new and better thing mm -hmm. with this box. Yeah. Because... Um, it's, it's not just repurposing it, but I like to think that we could actually even create a new piece of family history, a new yes, heirloom true, type thing, uh, you know, something that means something. Something that means something that was very specific. Well, but the meaning is <laughs> why it's so important, right? right. Yeah, you, you, you give the piece a new purpose and, you know, who knows who is going to enjoy next as well. Well, I Even am. if you don't use for yourself. You're going to put your jewelry there? I am. This is going to be for my collection of thrift store rings. Nice. Because I have an enormous collection that kind of happened by accident. I didn't mean to collect rings. Uh -huh. Something you like then, yeah. Mm, but something collect. you like. And then this one, this is actually a pretty clever little situation. So what I have here is just this... Uh, piece mm -hmm. of fiber or of, of mat board that's been wrapped in the fabric. And what we can then do is we can come in here and if we want to, we can bend it into a zigzag shape. Okay. We can bend it into rectangles or squares to make Ooh. as many little compartments mm -hmm. as we that want. want. Nice. Right. So you really, um, then this can become a very customizable Ooh, I like that. thing, um, which the other box that I did, I actually cut these and uh, made them into a specific shape mm -hmm. and then went, oh, 
You know what would be really cool? <laughs> the zigzag. Nice, look at this. Right? So we'd, we would want to glue this down when we decide, or if you, don't, if you want to, you can just leave it there just like that and then you can change it around later. Why not, yes. If you like, okay. um, or you can leave it. So let's go back to our lid here. Oh, that's a good sound. And then you can see. It's still a little wet. Still a little wet. Yeah. So at this point, what we would do is we'd come in and wipe off the extra because mm. that's obviously not going to soak in right this. And then in probably a couple months, I would want to give it one more coat okay. after it's had time to kind of soak in. Soak into mm -hmm. the deep side of the wood. Right, soak into the oh, deep. It's looking good. It does look good. And then we would just put the hinges back on. Uh-huh. And I'll just put one. Just to show. Yep. I just want to put one on just so we can open and close it. Okay. Because we do like that. And then we can marvel at how amazing <laughs> we are. No, oh, very cool. So, you know, I started making the, these things and then I went, huh. I wonder if I have to go do this with Shahar today or if I could just finish my other 14 boxes today instead. <laughs> okay. But I didn't. I thought it would be more fun to come and hang out with you. <laughs> but it is so satisfying and it was so fast. Well, that was the part that really astonished me was the how fast it was. You know what I like about this segment as a whole? It's because, it's, of course, you know that. It's not only recycling. Uh, is that teaching people how to see things in a different way. Because many times you go to a house that somebody has died or even a thrift store. Oh, no. Okay, no, 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 no. And you don't see the potential that that piece has. Right. Right. And then unlimited creativity here. Because if you, like you said, you, you want to do the decoupage with the ones that are lower quality. You can use beading on top. You can go right. crazy painting. Yes. Right, and this you can even, become a beautiful you gift. You even could put glass on the top. Wow, yes. What? Uh -huh. what? If only we knew a glass artist. <laughs> Somebody that could <laughs> cut and fuse some beautiful pieces. Look at this. See? A whole different deal. It is. Beautiful. And it then, of beautiful. course, look, 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 look. Right. Ah! Gorgeous. Hello. And the pieces here will oh, but wait, last. Wait, wait, but let's, wait. Oh, yes. Let's, let's put a look. ring there. Vintage oh, ring. Vintage from Do ring. From Jody's collection. Right. Vintage ring from Jody's collection. Yes. Right there. Very cool. I love it, Jody. And it was a quite fast project. It was. Yeah. That right. So it doesn't, mm -hmm. you well, don't have to sew. You don't have nope. to do anything. You'd probably want to come back and do another coat of, of oil in three months. But right. by then you'll. Right. This will be your lovely, cherished right. uh, jewelry box. Right. And now I have two. And you now you have two. Because this one also. But Look how just beautiful so pretty, this is. Right? Yes. So pretty. So what I really like about this segment is the fact that you are showing people how to see th things different and find new meanings for everything they have around them. So it's not just about recycling and the environment. There are all those things too. But it's this, okay, maybe this belonged to somebody you love, but you say it's so ugly. Look at this. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe it didn't. Maybe you got it at a thrift store. But yeah. I love the idea of learning to see the quality that is in things that maybe you didn't even know was there, mm -hmm. right? Like walnut boxes, which, which they're not going to be around forever. These no. are already 50 years old. And wow. so to, yes. to keep those preserved and, and I'm not a big fan of keeping things just because they're old, uh -huh. just because it's old doesn't mean it's good. Right. But if we can see the things that are old and mm. still good, yes. then, Very. then that's a Wise Bonus, words. You're right? inspired today. Oh, you know. Thank you so much for bringing <laughs> us this project. I think it's a great one for any level of skills out there. Yeah. And we all have boxes around us. Yes, Can't we wait do. for the next one. Do you want a preview sneak? No, no? Let's, let's, let's keep them <laughs> hanging. Right? And I, I'll see you. Deal. I will see you in the next one, okay? Well, I hope you had as much fun as 